right now in America, we have this terrible crisis in our children. You know, just all sorts of really very bad things are happening for children, and as a result of that happening by children. We have an epidemic in this country with children with attention deficit disorder. We use about 80 to 90 percent of the world's Ritalin. We're the only nation in the world that drugs our children. The third highest cause of death in American children between the ages of 5 and 17 is suicide. Never before in all of history have we had a culture whose children start committing suicide. And yet at that very time when, when there's such a crisis as this is happening, we're discovering so much about that newborn infant. It isn't just the physical survival we're talking about here. It's we're talking about the whole value of human life that is in jeopardy, that we're creating a society of people who are violent, who are scared, who don't trust, and it doesn't have to be that way. I think we have the, the chance to erase all forms of violence through the proper approach to pregnancy and birth and the first three years of life alone. Hi, I'm Noah Wiley, and this is my son, Owen. Having a child has been an amazing experience for me. It seems like every day I learn something new from Owen about how to be a father. As I discover more about who he is, I am filled with wonder at how strong and intense his presence already is at this early age. There's something about that sparkle in his eyes that I never want him to lose. As we search for ways to keep our children's spirits intact, we look to both cutting-edge science and older ways, traditional cultures, to help us find the answers. The message we are getting from every place that we look is that humans from every stage of life, from conception on, require love, acceptance, and acknowledgement in order to develop. What babies want is to be loved and respected as human beings right from the start. What you got there? Who's a baby sister? Usually we all start whole, complete, fine with ourselves. However, sometimes things happen along the way that teach us that we aren't okay or that we aren't lovable. School shootings, learning disorders, drugging our children, suicide from age 5 to 17, what happened to these children to bring them to this point? Rather than fall into the trap of blaming the children, we could look to our own actions and beliefs about what children are, about what babies are. Let's examine what's happening for children right from the beginning of their lives and explore the question, how can we help our children grow into their authentic selves and keep that spark alive? I think it starts at the beginning. It starts the way we are carrying our children, the way we are birthing our children, and the way we're caring for them afterwards, and the way we were birthed and cared for, because we pass it on. I think one of the most exciting things about the whole 20th century is, is coming into full awareness of what's involved in the birth process. From all of our studies now, we know that the baby is far more sophisticated than anything we ever gave it credit for being before. We didn't think it could have an experience. We didn't think it could sense anything. And we didn't think it had the brains to know 
what the senses were telling them. Babies seem to have a working mind, which is part of their consciousness, part of their human consciousness. It's not something that develops in stages, like the brain develops in stages. The mind is simply a part of who they are. That's a whole new idea. When people have recalled what happened very, very even at the earliest at conception in the prenatal period at birth, their level of recall of what they talk about um, goes beyond what they have the brain support to remember. Psychology wasn't digging into that ground. But now, very clever experiments are designed to use the simplest behaviors of the baby so the baby can tell us that it's listening or that it cares and that it remembers. Ultrasound allows us to peer into the womb and watch the behaviors of babies even before they are born. We've discovered that they are already interacting and in the case of twins, responding to each other. In one a pair of twins that were observed beginning at 20 weeks of gestation and followed for a couple of years after birth, when they were one year old, their favorite game was to take a position on either side of a curtain and to begin to touch each other through the curtain and begin to giggle and, and stroke each other from either side of the curtain. This was a behavior that was observed at 20 weeks in the womb. They were in separate little sacks and the one boy who was very active would come up to the sack and awaken his sister, get her excited, and she would always respond. And they would play together on either side of this curtain. They remembered that, of course. They had learned that in the womb. And they continued to do it. And we could see it both before birth and after. Babies are extraordinary communicators. And we hadn't thought that that would be possible. By communication, I mean the baby is in communication with the mother and father. The mother and father is in communication with the baby, whether they know it or not. So the signals are traveling back and forth constantly between the baby in the womb and the mother and father, although they may be just oblivious to that fact. Usually mothers intuitively start talking to the baby, and they were right. I think there have always been parents who knew this thousands of years ago and they did all the right things without having any science to it at all they did it intuitively like the Tibetans the Tibetans knew all along for thousands of years that their babies were real beings and they started to communicate with them very early they started to reorganize their lives around the coming of the baby. And they felt the baby was, was bringing a gift, might be a teacher for them. They, they could understand that the baby had a spirit, a soul, was a being, not a blob. I knew the moment that I conceived him. It wasn't about, yeah, I love you and, and we're gonna have a baby together. It was really about, let's ask this teacher Let's ask this person to share our lives with us. With children, um, we tend to think that, you know, it's only after we have given birth to them that, you know, they are, you know, worth investing energy. But in my tribe, you know, before you even conceive, there are a lot of things you have to do to get ready for them, you know, trying to sort out your own mess so that you don't transfer it onto the children. Mm -hmm. Pregnancy in many cultures is not only a time for the parents to examine their readiness and openness to a new life, but also for the community to embrace and support the parents and the new life coming in. Saban Fusome's name means keeper of the rituals in the Dagar language of West Africa's Burkina Faso. Saban Fu left Africa a decade ago to bring birth rituals to people around the world. She shows how ritual is used in our daily lives to honor and celebrate childbirth, children, and community. 
today uh, what we would like to do is to do one of the many welcoming ceremonies that we do in my tribe to welcome the child. Ayanti Mbamilena Tibual, Aziana. Ayanti Samilena Tibual. Now that I am here and I see different women going through the ritual process and you can feel the baby moving and there is a different energy, a different vibration that comes alive within the mother and the baby. I think that is one of the things that really reassures the babies that, hey, I'm going to an okay place and I can really be there and I can take my gift there. to the baby is whatever it is in your heart whatever make you feel welcome Say to them, we appreciate you gifting us with your gift that you are going to bring. And it is also a way of reminding them that if they're forgetting little gifts, is that we need to bring them too. And at the same time, a way of telling them that there is going to be some arms here to hold them when they come. We don't come here as tourists. We come here as uh, people bearing basket full of goodies that we want to bring to the world. So we are coming here because we have a purpose, something to give to the world. As you continue this journey, that you continue it with peace, with love and with a lot of support. May the spirit you are bringing bring the very medicine that the world needs for healing. It has been really exciting sharing and seeing people's reaction to the healing that it has brought for so many uh, families and uh, so many generations. The slightest things that the mother is doing are part of the baby's environment and affect the baby, so they will start moving very shortly after a mother laughs, for example. So you can, you can imagine uh, what's happening to babies if, if the parents are fighting, if the mother is in grief about something, uh, if there's a separation, if there is a death, like the father dying before birth. Babies are really tuned into their environment. And that's a whole new idea about the consciousness of a baby in the womb. Research now shows very clearly that the mother's emotional state during pregnancy determines the actual shape, nature, and character of the brain structure that grows in the infant. This has been established without any question. All mammals follow the same pattern. If the mother is in a state of high anxiety, fear, worry, and so forth, she gives birth to an infant with a different brain structure one with a much larger what we call the old hind brain, the survival, the sensory motor brain, and a much reduced size intellectual creative brain. It's as though at every birth nature is saying, well, can we go for more intelligence or do we have to defend ourselves again? Babies learn very early, children learn very early to not listen to their hearts, to not trust their feelings, to not express their feelings, and they shut down the love that they have to give and they live in a hypervigilant stance, always wondering, what should I be? What do they want from me? Or what do you want from me? And people spend their lives that way. It's really important with all this new information coming out that we not blame moms. 
that we support our moms to do what they innately know is right. The more the mother is accepted and given unconditional love and support by her society, the greater the chance the infant in her womb has of being born fully human, you might say. As some countries have, such as Sweden, and in fact, Austria has now followed Sweden's uh, lead, and Holland is also picking up on it, of literally full support of the mother, both in pregnancy and in the first three years of the child's life. There's no paternity leave in our country. There's hardly any maternity leave. I just wish so much that our government would support a mother being with the child for the first three years. There's so many studies to show that those first three years form the person. What was your first impression? Were you welcomed? Was it a rejoicing time? Was your mother delighted she was pregnant? Was it a stressful time for her? Did she talk to you? Because you were listening. When we come from the belief that babies are conscious, every way we are with our babies changes. We include them. We know that they're taking everything in. It's imprinting. It is the course of what is life here as human being like. <laughs> When Owen was born, he was clearly looking for us. And our responses to each other then underlie our relationship now. Bonding is the basis of emotional connection between baby and mother and baby and father. It starts at the beginning of life and develops as the baby forms in utero. When babies are born, it can be a very intense experience for them as well as their parents. As the baby emerges, there's a huge emotional drive for parents and their newborn child to connect and settle in together. This time of settling in together deepens their bond. That bonding is brought about by skin-to-skin -skin contact of mother and infant after the infant comes out of the womb. And this bonding process goes on and we know exactly what it is. We know the three points of it. Audio-visual communication, which means eye contact and the mother's voice, nurturing, breastfeeding, holding, massaging, fondling the infant in every way, and play, and the play that spontaneously arises between the infant, right from the beginning, practically, and the mother. You just squirt, oh, oh, I didn't mean to squirt you. Teeth, lips. If those three things are enacted, then you have healthy growth in the child, and the interesting thing, you have tremendous new growth in the mother. She discovers an aspect of herself that she's never experienced before. I felt so in love with everyone in the room. It was incredible. I mean, at one moment I was in so much pain and then the next second I'd never experienced so much love and joy <laughs> for everyone around me. And especially little Ethan, of course. I can't believe it the way I feel at that time. The doctor put him and brought away into my stomach and he was in my stomach when he burned. I forget everything else, you know, it was so happy. <laughs> that bonding brings out as much new information in the mother's encoded system as it does in the child's. They, they create a dynamic and each is bringing the other into a new form of awareness. It was this unfolding of me. I had this huge rush of love and of course I love this little infant baby more than I could ever imagine. This something opens up in you. It's like a trap door that all of a sudden you know, you didn't know you had this particular well of feelings. These are expectancies in that child. When they open their eyes and look around, they're looking for a face. And at close quarters, not only will their eyes lock on the human face and its eyes, but that turns on the entire infant's brain. It turns on their awareness in this new setting they find themselves in. Within minutes, they're functioning on a level of response which the child not given that face of birth is an average of three months late in developing. So it's sort of like there's glue on the mother and there's glue on the baby right after birth. And, and if they get to do this right afterwards, it, it sort of sets and they connect and they meet each other, soul to soul, body to body. And when one is taken away for one reason or another, the glue starts to dry a little bit. And so when it's postponed, it can take a little more work to get the glue to stick. 
And it still can happen. It can happen throughout a lifetime, and I think it really does. But if it gets to do it right from the beginning, there's a lot less effort involved in the connecting. The face needs to be at a distance of 6 to 12 inches away to really function as the wake-up call to that new life to come into this world. 6 to 12 inches away just happens to be, by strangest coincidence, right at the point of nurturing. Yeah, when you born, little guy, I was so happy when I saw you in the top of my pony. I saw your face looking at where I am, and I go, oh, there's my little baby. You was trying to find out where you are. And you know what? You was already with me. Baby knows mom from inside. Meeting mom from outside is a different experience. The way they come into contact, that sets the pattern for how it'll happen again and again and again later on. The second he came in, when he heard Tracy's voice, he picked his head up and looked in her direction. And then when I spoke, he picked his head up and looked in my direction. And Remember, you looked right at us and went, oh, OK, oh, there you are. Oh, that's right. We were able to start a beautiful tradition that's followed in many cultures. We're staying in and around the house for 40 days. We're keeping the baby in dim light for at least the first couple of weeks. Newborns, they have a much slower rate at integrating what's happened to them than adults do. It takes them about six times longer. Owen's always been very trusting because we, starting with that simply and bringing him slowly and willingly into our world has really seemed to make him a very secure child. Even with the new evidence coming out about what babies need in those first few precious moments, many hospitals still follow protocols that separate mother and infant at birth. I've watched hospitals be so aggressive in separating mother, father, and baby that the majority of babies are spending two hours in the nursery before they get a chance to get cuddled by mom and dad. From the very beginning, we're building the capacity to trust. And if the baby isn't held and treated gently, if the baby is taken away and mom and baby are separated, the very first impression that the baby has is, where's my mom? The baby will bond, but they'll bond with the machine that's next to them. And they'll bond with the crib or the walls or the noise from the lights, but they're not bonding with a human being. I think for most people, birth is a nightmare. It hasn't been what a baby would want because we didn't consider that there was anybody there who could care. But it's generally violent. It violates all the senses of the baby. The light is too bright. The room is too cold. There's rough handling. They don't want to be washed and wiped roughly. They don't want to be injected with anything. They don't want to be held up by the foot upside down. They don't want to be slapped if slapping is necessary to get them breathing. And it's, it's, it's a... It's a crazy experience for a baby. It's a terrible way to start. When they first get here, it seems to me like they're just getting used to breathing through their lungs for the first time. Their circulatory system is changing. There's a lot of new pathways that are being made inside. And when they just get to settle in that and allow that to happen for the first 20 minutes or so, there's an impulse inside of them that shows this readiness to head north and find the breast and what discover what's there. And if we can just support that and look for that impulse and not be so busy that we're missing that signal that the baby's ready to go there, it seems like everything just works a lot better. And what babies need is peace and quiet, warmth, a transition that should be as gentle as can be. Ironically, the hospital, which we consider the safest place to have a baby, can implement protocols that in fact pose certain threats to the baby's healthy development. Many experts believe that separation of mother, family, and baby, unnecessary procedures, and a lack of sensitivity disrupt bonding and are all serious concerns. If you go to a, a big, high-powered hospital, 
They're very good at taking care of, of the severely premature babies and the, and the sick babies, but what confuses them is your healthy seven or eight pound baby born right on time. They want to give the baby a bath. The baby does, is not dirty. The baby's a little gooey, does not need a bath. Certainly doesn't need to go to a nursery to get a bath. They want to weigh the baby. If they want to weigh the baby, they can wait and the scale has wheels. The baby doesn't need to go anywhere. They can take a baby's temperature under the baby's arm in the mom's arms. The baby should be kept warm. And the best way to keep a baby warm is not with a lot of blankets and with a, a, an electronic warmer, but instead in mom's arms, on mom's chest, and if mom is busy with dad held close to dad's chest. When you separate a baby from his mother and father, and you take it to the newborn intensive care unit, and you do tests and you put in an IV, and you do three days of, of antibiotic treatment just in case, you're taking risks. The vast majority of babies, healthy full-term babies, will stabilize and normalize much better in their mother and father's arms than they will in the nursery. Much, much better. When the baby is in contact with the mother, something happens in their nervous system that helps them to respond quicker than if they're away from the mother's body. And so if when the baby is born and needs to be suctioned and given oxygen, that it's done in proximity of the mother's body, if not on the body, right beside the body, so that the mother can stay in physical contact and the cord can stay connected and so that that baby can continue to get oxygen and nutrients through the cord while they're struggling to get here, rather than having that connection severed and whooshed, whisked away. They're still held as a unit and that connection is honored. It's only in the last decade or so that we've been serious about the fact that newborn infants can actually have pain. We used to stand and watch them scream and yell and smile about it in a delivery room. If a baby was crying, we thought that was normal. We said, oh, what a healthy baby because it has a strong cry. <laughs> well, we were not treating that as genuine communication because obstetrics and medicine in general had this idea the baby could not be having a real experience. So whatever you did to it was okay. They're little bitty human beings. They have sensations and feelings and to assume otherwise is ridiculous and it's not scientific either. One of the things that I'm doing in my work right now is working in the Beba Clinic with Ray Castellino. And one of the early sessions that I was observing was a mother that I had worked with in her pregnancy and birth. She gave birth in the birthing room and then the baby was taken to the NICU. The purpose that the mother had in coming into the Beba Clinic was that she wanted to investigate what was in the way between the relationship of her and her daughter and felt that there was a connection that had to do with the birth. And so she came in to explore that and her daughter was now six years old. The little girl came in with her mom and went to the closet and chose to pick out this box of miniature hospital supplies and put it on the floor and began to set up this little scene. And as I watched what she was doing, I started to realize what scene she was setting up, which was in the hospital at her birth. And she got a bed and put her mother in the bed and put an IV pole on one side of the bed and put little tiny slippers on the other side of the bed where her, her mother had actually left the slippers on that side of the bed and the IV was on the side of the bed she put it on. She goes, the daddy, the daddy, where's the daddy? And she digs through the box and gets a man and puts him right next to the IV pole and at the birth, the father sat on a stool right beside the ivy pole. She told the story of how it happened, and then as she nudged that little baby toward the mother's bed, and now the father's present, she picked the baby up and put her on her mama's belly. And so she created the healing of what she wished would have happened. She then jumped into the mother's arms. They hugged, they kissed, they looked into each other's eyes and just melted together. So beautiful just melted that barrier away. Just let them be completely connected because they had missed that at birth. They didn't get to do it right away and there was still a little part left to happen. I don't think it's 
anybody's conscious fault. But I think the medical world doesn't validate the emotional, the spiritual life of the mother and the child, the reality of human values. They are so focused, as rightfully they should be, on the physical, but they neglect the other, and the other is very important. It is a heart-opening human ritual that needs to be honored and respected and have as little medical intervention as possible. My medical intuition would tell me that there are lasting consequences to being hurt when you're a newborn baby or to being separated from your parents when you're a newborn baby. It really is a big deal. I think women are now claiming that it's their birth. It's not the hospital's birth. It's not the hospital's baby. It's not the doctor's baby. It's their baby. It's an incredible experience that their whole family is having. And so more and more I think women are now becoming aware of the fact it's really important to keep your baby with you, especially if there's been a trauma, because it heals the baby. It lowers the stress hormones, brings endorphins for both of them. It's a sacred moment and it should not be violated unless, of course, it's a medical emergency and then you do whatever you can to save the mother and the child. I had no idea that little ones recorded everything. And I had sort of prided myself in knowing what newborns knew, that they were sensitive beings and they felt. And in this session, I felt like I was starting at the beginning again and just beginning to understand what it is they really take in. It has been astonishing to discover just how much we remember and how deeply we are affected by those early unconscious memories. New advances in neuropsychology have shown that the imprints of our first experiences set up belief systems and behavior patterns that continue into adult life. Memory has always been a mystery in psychology. We haven't done well explaining it. We didn't know that much about it. Most of our theories turn out to be wrong. The evidence shows now that we track our experience right from the start, right from conception, and we're tracking until we die. Everybody remembers their birth, but not in the way you would expect. You'll see certain movement patterns, and those movement patterns and the positions are actually reminiscent of the imprinting that occurred during birth. That's a way of remembering. I'm remembering with my body. Now, when things go wrong at birth, let's say the cord gets dangerously uh, wrapped around the neck, those babies begin to act out their memory of having that cord around them at birth. And once you know that, you can see what's happening. But the person himself may not be able to explain it at all. It's like a felt sense in the body, more than a recall. Like, oh yeah, I remember the time. It's not that kind of a memory. So many times people will regress back to their birth or a prenatal experience and then go home and check it out. And they're amazed. People who have explored their birth through therapy have found that some of those early events have profoundly affected their lives as adults in such areas as trust, relationship development, and a sense of safety or well-being in the world. In my experience sitting with babies and families and adults of all ages, all of us have the birth imprinting. Back in September, I did my first process workshop with Ray, and my intention for that was to gain some understanding of my birth because it was a non-labor cesarean with general anesthesia, so my mother didn't remember anything. And um, it was an incredible experience because I really got to feel what went on. And um, I had had a chronic neck pain uh, for a long time and what I realized during that session was at one point during the birth the doctor basically just took my head and I mean it felt like my my neck was complete my head was completely spun around obviously it wasn't but it was a definite injury and um, and I felt it and I experienced the emotion around it and then it was gone and it hasn't been back since which to me is just absolutely miraculous
how is it possible that these early experiences can continue to negatively affect a person throughout their life? Beliefs about how the world is going to treat me and how I have to be in order to survive begin to get established in those first minutes and hours of life. And often the parents don't understand that and they reinforce it. And then we see it reinforced in school. For example, a child may have had a separation at birth and been really scared. Maybe they had tubes down their throat and they go home and mom and dad are very present and very wonderful, but they don't understand that every time the baby starts to eat, they get scared and so they spit up and they start crying. So mom thinks my breast is no good for the baby and mom frowns. Baby gets reinforced, oh, what I'm doing is not acceptable. Maybe I'm not acceptable. And so the baby gets more fussy. So they get labeled. And then the child begins to live up to that label. Mom and dad think we have to control that behavior. And we blame them. You're a bad boy. You're a bad girl. Or don't do that. I can't stand that when you do that. And the truth is the child is simply afraid. If we want a change in their behavior, we must model that change in our behavior. We as adults are all determined that we're going to mold the behavior of that child through verbal instructions, and they can only become who we are. You don't have to teach the child emotional intelligence. You have to be it around them. You can't keep the brain from absorbing it. Once a family understands what's going on, there are many ways they can work together to find healing, to release themselves from the confusion caused by these early imprints. I've had so many clients where someone is there that feels that the baby's coming out and the doctor isn't there yet, and so they will cross the mother's legs or they will push the baby back inside, and that is very traumatic for a baby. It sets up a negative pattern between the mother and the baby, and the mother gets blamed for it. And it wasn't the mother's fault. I was supposed to come on my mother's birthday, but I didn't show up on time, and so my mother panicked and she wanted my father to take her to the hospital in Cheyenne, so they started out and about a half or a little better than half the way there, I started to be born. And so my mother got out of the car and got in a ditch and my head came out and my father panicked and he pushed my head back in, closed my mother's legs, put, me, put her back in the car and then drove on to the next town where they carried my mother up the stairs and I was born in an office up above the drugstore. I really didn't want to come out the second time. I mean, I was ready and willing the first time, but the second time, it was like, it was too scary out there, they didn't want me, uh, they had rejected me, and um, I, I wanted to just stay there and boom and die. Just the knowledge of that experience throughout my life, and there was never any doubt about the facts. I did get my head pushed back in. Um, that experience, I think, has had a profound effect on, on me all my life because my whole life has sort of been one abandonment after another. And, um, you know, I can trace it all the way through my life. I felt abandoned then, and I have felt abandoned over and over again since. These processes that happen early on, sometimes in utero, sometimes before birth, or during birth, or right after birth, set up a pattern that we live over and over and over again until we discover what it is. So many things happen along the road, from conception, prenatal, and birth, and beyond, where it wasn't perfect. One of the natural first responses is to feel, oh my God, but that means that I hurt my baby? Wait a minute, I, did, I was trying so hard to be so loving in there. Lauren was planning on having a home birth. She was out driving with her husband and son when her labor started. As they raced home, Lauren's labor escalated to the point of pushing. I have my hand down and I'm, I'm feeling her head. That's where she's at, I can feel her head. And uh, she's very close. I felt a contraction coming on. I put my feet against one door and I was stretched all the way across the whole back seat. And I made my body as tense and rigid as I possibly could. And I held with every ounce of strength I had not to push because that was like the contraction to have her. <laughs> if the mother can tell the story to the child of what happened and why it happened, and that everybody involved was really doing 
their best and had best intentions for mother and baby. And for the mother to apologize, to tell the baby that she's sorry, can really help the baby integrate what happened in the beginning. And the sooner the mother can do that, the sooner that they can really begin to heal that place that was missed. I didn't want to be having to hold her back, yes. to hold her in from what she needed to be doing. She said, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bonding can be picked up almost any time of life. Our need for it is so great. And so if you miss it at birth, it can still be picked up any time later in life. Body molding, eye contact, and sweet sounds <laughs> can bring about bonding at any age. And I said, well, even in our mid-70s, I guarantee you we need eye contact, body molding, and sweet sounds in our life. Birth can be the opening to some of the most amazing experiences of our lives. Around the time of birth, for a few precious moments, we are sometimes able to tap into something so ancient, primal, and wise that we are able to transcend our limited view of what's possible. I think it was the day after we brought him home, and you guys were upstairs lying in bed, and I was sitting down on the living room couch, and I was thinking about the way he smelled when he came out, which was such a strong smell, the smell of the vernix, and the smell of, of you, and the smell of him. And it was almost like that smell was just in my nose, and I couldn't get it out, and I was just sort of enjoying how powerful it was. And then it was almost like it went down into my chest, and my chest got really warm, and almost like it was starting to burn, and it was almost like, um, just his sense uh, was burning its way into me, like it was never gonna be erased, and my heart just exploded. Mm. It, was, it was really very powerful. And I have talked to other fathers, and I said, then that thing where you smell the baby, and the baby's smell comes into you and burns your lungs, they look at me like, <laughs> what? But it was, I had it, it was really powerful, and it was sort of like him imprinting himself on me in a very visceral way. Where is our son? He's there. <laughs> He's there. I actually felt as if I wanted to lick him. I had this primal urge to lick, lick him and and lick him clean. I guess and it's just this amazing thing. So I, I just kind of licked his cheeks a little bit and did that much and uh, held him up. I wanted to like hold him up in the living room. I was just holding him and thanking the universe for this wonderful child. And uh, I felt that that was the fatherly thing to do. These ancient encoded uh, wisdoms and power and strength that are released at the moment of birth. Well, I, I'd read about this, but I'd never delivered one of my own until 20 years ago. And I had grown children then, and I think eight or nine grandchildren by then, but I had another child of my own, and delivered it. I mean, I was there, I was the only other person present at its birth, is the child's mother delivered it. But I, I was stunned and astonished at the tremendous energy that filled the whole house. It, the house shook with that energy. It was, it was an awesome, near mystical experience for me. I would say it's the closest thing to a wide awake mystical experience I'd ever had. Those of us who have, have delivered our own children and made that contact ourselves know that it's an invitation to the greatest intimacy that life ever affords us, offered in just that moment. And the, the infant is the one who offers that total vulnerable intimacy. And if we do not meet it, then the infant feels betrayed by the world. And so they're coming into a world they can't trust 
because it does not meet their, their most critical need right at that point. Being adopted and not having any sense of a presence at birth, there hasn't been much of a bond with um, anyone. I'm a very independent, strong woman who has a lot together in terms of career, but I, I don't have it as, uh, together in terms of relationship. I don't know that um, I know how to form really close bonds or even what that is. And, and that's a loss, so I hear. I mean, I'm not really sure, <laughs> not having had one. It would just be nice to, uh, you know, uh, I guess, learn how to trust. Teresa has been invited to participate in a small therapy group facilitated by Dr. Marty Glenn. With the support of the group, she seeks to uncover the truth about her birth and break out of her isolation. I'd like to have you share your intention, what you would hope your work here would accomplish for you. My intention is not only to go back and try to give myself some feeling about my birth, but to um, also try to, to uh, bring that to my present relationships, my present life. What might you experience if you had that? Do you know what I'm saying? A sense of normalcy, a sense of being like every other human being, mm. a sense of not being uh, alien in some way. And the rocking place and the breathing place. I feel pretty um, clearly that she died while I was being born. Mm. And I wanted to go with her. I did not want to live without her. Mm -hmm. I'm angry that the arms that took me out of there weren't hers. It's like I've never really acknowledged that uh, she died right. and I never got consoled or comforted mm. for being uh, mm. for her death I haven't even been allowed to honor them or acknowledge them I had to acknowledge the death. Yes, that's right. Before I could feel like I even had a right mm -hmm. to my birth. That's right. No. Or to let other people love me. It feels good to have told my story and to have it be held. Mm -hmm. It's a story I've never told. Mm -hmm. It's one I've never been willing to admit. I was really blind to feel that I was any different. I'm very much the same. Mm -hmm. It is such a beautiful heart-opening experience. It's sacred work, I think, to be allowed to be with someone. When they have that experience of touching and opening their hearts is beautiful to be with someone when they get into an altered state of consciousness and they experience their true self sometimes they say it's my soul sometimes they say it's my essence sometimes they say it's my lost self that I've been wondering where would I ever find myself again the self is there from the very beginning for some people, early experiences can bury their fundamental nature underneath trauma, grief, or shame. But as parents, there are things we can do to encourage that spark and keep it alive. 
During gestation, birth, and the early years, it is so important for us to connect with our children and to listen to who they are and what their purpose is. In this way, we can help them stay on their path as they grow. Sabanfu reminds us that in her culture, at every step along the way, the incoming child is honored and things are done to make sure that they know that they are welcomed and wanted and needed. All these different rituals are done to ensure that the spirit of a new coming child is kept intact. Birth is another excuse for the elders to do another welcoming. They put children uh, of about mm, five or six years old or so uh, into a room next door so that when the baby comes out and screams out the first cry, then all the children must respond to that cry because it is like a coded message saying, hello, I am here, anybody around? And when the other children cry back, it is saying, yes, welcome, you have arrived at the right place. You got a sister. One of our basic, basic needs is to be included, to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, and to know that someone cares enough about us, loves us enough to be that tender with us to listen. It is not simply the responsibility of the parents to receive the infant. It's important for the whole community to come forward and receive and welcome each child. Our survival depends on us being able to connect with other people. Our capacity for relationship begins very early. We value our independence in this nation so tremendously. And of course, nobody wants to be very dependent and codependent, but there's an interdependence that is the, the healthy way to be. When you do not belong, when you don't feel embraced by a community, that actually is a reason to start your grief right there. And uh, a lot of us walk around carrying grief on every part of our body, in every cell of ours, because we are invisible. We are not seen because the com community has not embraced us for us to get out of our invisibility. What we see is children trying to find a place for themselves, trying to be noticed, trying to have someone get who they are. If the community doesn't come together and take true ownership of the lives of the youth that exist within that community, then when the option for a child is suffer through it in a world that is foreign and feels very harsh and negative to you, or enter into a community that may be unhealthy, but is going to, in its own way, be there for you, you know, the choice is going to be to f find that community, even if it's a negative one. That sense of belonging and that sense of home will only come only if a community opens its arm and say, yes, we know who we are, you are, and we want to welcome what you have to give and who you are. And at that point, um, we feel like something has overtaken us and all of a sudden we belong. This feeling of belonging is so important to everyone. Cutting edge research is revealing that infants are awake and aware and they know if they are wanted. They need a nurturing environment. They want to know that they are coming into a place where they belong, where they are loved, and where they can give their own love. We see the psychological damage in too many adults who are not met in this way, and who have spent their adult lives searching to heal their loss. If we offer babies and children a world that wants them, believes in them, and trusts them, if we change our own ideas about what babies want, about what people want, perhaps we can bring more hope, more love, and more healing into the world.